Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Looney by Spike Milligan, an Irish fantasy. Uh, so I'm going to check, is there a blurb? Yeah, there is a blurb. So I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and share some of my uh, tabs and my thoughts from throughout it, before giving you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will warn you, there's a cat down here. Biggie, what are you doing? You want to go outside? Arr! Biggie's here. Say hello to everybody, Biggie. Mm. Hello. My name is Biggie Cat and I approve of this review. Okay, so uh, before we get started, one thing I will say is this book is pretty racist. Uh, I think it was published in 87, 1987, and I think it would have been considered pretty racist at the time, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so I made myself a bet going in that it wouldn't be long until I saw my first N-word, and we shall see how that goes along. But anyway, the blurb. Spike Milligan's first novel since Pacoon. Mick Looney's father told him, while on his HP deathbed, that they were descended from the Kings of Ireland. So what was he doing living in Kilburn, mixing cement for molems in the rain? What indeed, thought Looney. And so, having acquired a throne and a parking ticket, though alas no confirmation of his royal heritage, Mick Looney vacates 113B Ethel Road, Kilburn, and returns to the Emerald Isle to claim what is wrongfully his. Spike Milligan's story bursts out with chaotic Irish brilliance and wit as he capitulates his hero into a world inhabited by a fortune teller who can only read the past. A racehorse painted black on one side and white on the other, a rather indignant ant called Norman, the phantom Mario Lanz impersonator, and many, many more. Will the search for royal blood bear fruit, or even a packet of onion flavoured crisps, a Mars bar, a Big Mac, and possibly a Chinese takeaway? Join the millions of Miller fans everywhere, the adventures of Mick Looney, pretender to the Irish throne, and Milligan's most irresistibly comic creation to date, provide a rare and royal feast. Read on. So we have the dedication here. I wish to get dedicate this book to Paul Getty Jr. for helping support some of my causes. Also to Jack Hobbs for his friendship and to Dick Douglas Boyd for letting me call him Doug Dickless Boyd. So we, right at the start, uh, like chapter one, I guess the loony, I wanted to read this out. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth with, it would appear, Irish labour. It took the Lord six days and on the seventh he rested during which time speculative builders put up Kilburn. Kilburn High Street runs three miles. That's why it looks shagged out. A walk through Kilburn has left an indelible blank on my mind. The British, it is said, are made up of four races. The best of these are the Derby and the Oaks. Kilburn was a melting pot, occasionally stirred by the National Front, an extreme political organisation whose election manifesto was, I'll punch your fucking head in. The leaders were any of them that could count up to ten without having to sit down. So he does poke fun at the Irish as well, so I guess that's okay. Right, here we are, page four, and we get two end bombs. So it didn't take long. I do quite like this line. Occasionally came a burst of Hindu voices. It all sounded like a very difficult clue in the Times crossword. Now, I don't know necessarily singling out Hindu voices, but I do think that's kind of what it's like when you overhear somebody speaking a language that you don't speak, or even talking about a TV show that you don't watch, to be honest. We get this line here. Next to him, Mrs. Looney read the sun and ate a pork pie. She would have been better nourished and better read had she eaten the sun and read the pie. Probably true. Although I don't think pork, pie pork pies and the sun are about as intellectually and biologically nourishing as each other, I think. We got poke at Jewish people again. Pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> she says, uh, Mrs. Thrills was musing over the policeman's foreplay, which that consisted of, hello, darling, look at this, which was better than her Jewish husband's, which was 20 minutes of begging in a post-dated check. So I don't know what's worse, that that's in there, or that, that I understand that that's a jibe at Jewish people being obsessed with money, because apparently they are, if you ask a racist. Or in this case, I guess, just a bigot. Good old fashioned bigotry rather than racism there. Quite an interesting start of the uh, chapter here to the Hindus too. London, steaming metropolis of grop, grime, grit, gunk and grunge, mugging, Molotov cocktails, rape, football hooligans, bombs and assassinations. Dr. Johnson said, he who is tired of London is tired of life. Fuck him. Uh, we get this little bit. He was greeted at the door by two vicars wearing stocking masks. There was an awkward silence. Who are you? said Mr. Tolley. One vicar stepped forward. We are Jehovah's burglars, he said. I don't understand, said Mr. Tolley. You see, the man went on, we are being persecuted by the police for our beliefs. Oh, queried Mr. Tolley, what are your beliefs? We believe, said the man, pushing Mr. Tolley back into the hall, that you've got a lot of silver in the house. Okay, so here we have one of the characters, he, he I can't even read this out really, he says, he liked the Nazis, if Hitler were alive today, there wouldn't be all these N-bombs and W-bombs in Kilburn. Hitler would stop all those N-bombs jumping up and down at discos. He'd put Velcro on the ceiling. Jesus Christ, Spike! Granted, this is him trying to write a character who is specifically racist, but it doesn't, it's not a good look when in the bits that aren't supposed to be specifically racist, he's still racist. Here we have the court case. I'm going to read this little bit out. 
A bureaucrat is a man who obeys orders from above and ignores complaints from below. So, to clerk of court Reuben Scratcher. His father Dick had been the last official hangman in Britain. Dick Scratcher, persecuted at school and at work for his name, sought his revenge by accepting the appointment as official hangman. For years he had a swinging time. Then, the government had abolished capital punishment, consigning Dick Scratcher to the unemployment exchange at Catford. It was a human tragedy. Oh, he tried, how he tried to get work. He tried the gas board, the water board, Batsy Dog's Home, Paul Raymond's Review Bar, the Palladium, Harrods. None of them wanted to hang them. Come the day when in desperation he tried to hang himself, he bungled the job, he twisted his neck but was still alive. His wife was so ashamed that she was all for leaving him there. His son took pity and cut him down, fracturing his father's ankles. Oh, the disgrace. Bungling his own hanging. It was all too much. He died a broken man. A very broken one. A tram ran over him. We get a character who says, For 30 years now I've been paying into the National Health Service and uh, I think it's about time I used it. Oh, I, sort of went a bit, started Irish, went American there. So, so he wants, he's asking the doctor like, which illnesses can you give me? We get a reference to Glenn Miller's In The Mood, which is funny because I was talking to Susie about that, like the day before I read this. Uh, and was playing, playing it to her saying, and said like, now you'll know if you ever hear a reference to Gwen, Glenn Miller's In The Mood, that's the song. Because everyone knows the song, but nobody knows that that's what it is. It goes, uh, I don't know, I'll put some footage in here actually. I'll put the music in the background. Let's have some Glenn Miller while I continue this review. We get this bit, um, from inside Jenkins cocked a shotgun and peered through the letterbox. Clear out, you Hindu swine. We had relatives in the black hole of Calcutta. Loud Kaka was stunned. I'm not from Calcutta, he said. I'm from Kilburn. Great line here. Flashing, according to the Daily Mirror poll, was one of the ten most popular crimes amongst elderly women. He says, this day, a sea of fat, white, appalling bodies was socialising in the sun. Some were playing badminton, male and female appendages flying gaily in all directions. Others disported themselves on the sun terrace. There was a huge fat woman with hairs on her fanny like a deserted crow's nest, and a long, thin male with a willy that reached to his knee with a curve in it that made it look like a hockey stick with an egg cosy on the end. Here we have, uh, this week was another amazing story. The man who had photographed the opening of King Tutankhamun's tomb with its alleged curse, Lawrence Dawson, had died aged 99 and the headline read, The curse still rings true. About right. We get this nice exchange. Of course I love you, he said in his sing-song Hindu voice. Then why don't you marry me? She gasped between thrusts. Oh no, that is against my religion. The great book of the Bhagavad Gita says no Hindu must marry a Christian. Rosie couldn't get it clear. A Hindu could fuck the arse off a Christian, but marriage, no. A, a great example of... So, so why I like Milligan is he has these great one-liners, so this guy gets trapped beneath a horse, and his brother pulls him out and says, one last great long heave, and Rory pulled his brother free. Yes, free. Why should he charge him? So those are the bits that I like, as opposed to the overuse of any racial slur he can think of. And one like this. Would the inspector like a nightcap? No thanks, he always slept bareheaded. Start of the chapter here, the loony in the castle we have. It was an apple green misty morning. Everything seemed unreal in the translucent light. Loony shaved in a cracked mirror that made him look like a schizophrenic. It must be terrible to be a schizophrenic. Still, you could go to the pictures alone and not feel alone. At a disco, you could go as your own partner. And then the loony catches a bus and uh, he says, Do you go to Limerick? He said to the conductor. I have to, said the man desperately. This bus goes there. And uh, he meets uh, a lady who's got a cat and she says, uh, Yes, it's a Tom. I'm taking him for the operation. Poor little bugger, having his knackers ripped off. Those people who believed in reincarnation had a lot to answer for. Why, that could be the late Frederick Chopin in that basket. A terrible thing to cut the balls after a man who invented the nocturnes. What colour is he? Another wave of ageing onions, as she said. Black. Oh, uh, N-bomb. Then it couldn't be Chopin. Chopin wasn't an N-bomb. So it must be that poor N-bomb, Duke Ellington. Their hot banjo player and singer of C-bomb songs. Well, at least there's some diversity in terms of the racial slurs he's used, and I count three different ones for black people now. All right, let me get this little exchange in a pub. Entering a pub, he ordered a Jameson. Do you want ice? Said the barman. Ice? Ice, he said. Man, did you not know what it did to their Titanic? I was never on it, said the barman. We got this exchange, which I enjoyed. Do you think this is the work of one man or a gang? Said Sergeant Kelly. Yes said Mutrus. I think it's the work of one man or a gang. I want to read this little bit here. Uh, Galloping at speed under a tree, the gay Groucho Marx was dislodged by a low branch. He swung there momentarily, long enough to say, are you the Nat West? They've got branches everywhere. Then he fell off into the lap of the oncoming James Bond, only to squash his balls yet again. Just dropped him for a chat, said the gay Groucho, waggling his eyebrows. My horse has just gone on ahead. Normally he goes on legs. Up to now it's been a stable relationship. He got the bit between his teeth. If I had a bit between my teeth, I'd give up muff diving. And then I like this line here as well. Fancy, just by looking into the mirror, you could double your money. So yeah, overall, The Looney by Spike Milligan. I mean, 
the overuse of the racist terms in it really is a bit of a downer on it. I can't give it anything more than a three out of five because of that. Although, you know, trying to separate the art from the artist and all that. Well, he's dead, so there's that as well. Here he is, here he is, white man, obviously. And uh, middle aged well, old white man by this point. But um, yeah, I mean, the one-liners in it were good. So if you can get past the racism, it's all right. But because of the racism, it's not all right. So three out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Looney by Spike Milligan. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought. If you've read this book in the comments, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.